Before we start, if you're enjoying these conversations, please make sure that you like or subscribe to Cleaning Up. It really helps other people to find us. Hello, my name is Michael Liebreich and this is Cleaning Up. Our episode this week is brought to you by Euroelectric. That's the association of the European electricity industry with over 3,500 members in 34 countries, spanning everything from generation through distribution and supply of electricity, and whose Secretary General, Christian Ruby, was our guest on episode 34. Our guest today is Nigel Topping. He's the high-level climate action champion for COP26, the climate conference that takes place in November in Glasgow. He's also been CEO of We Mean Business and Secretary General of CDP, formerly the Carbon Disclosure Project. Please welcome Nigel Topping, to cleaning up. So, Nigel, thank you very much for joining me here on Cleaning Up. Great to be with you, Michael. Let's start with COP26. That's the big climate conference, which uh, was already delayed one year, but is going to take place in November this year, unless you know otherwise. You are a high-level climate action champion for COP26. Can you... The audience tell me, what does that mean? Um, well, the, the role was created in as part of the Paris Agreement, um, you know, five just over five years ago, in recognition by the parties to the UN Climate Convention, the, the, the countries, that this is such a big deal that countries can't do it on their own, and that they wanted somebody to, in parallel to the multilateral process, be working to drive what they call non-state actors. So, to you and me, that's mainly private sector, local government, and civil society. So, everyone who's not got a seat at the table to raise their ambition and drive action and in so doing to support faster action by the the countries. So that's that's my job is to be the sort of generally to push everyone to go faster. I mean, it's a fabulous vision, but you know, Monday morning, the first day when you sort of got into into that role, what on earth did you do? I mean, where do you start? Because you never come into, uh, I mean, because the role had existed for five years. So I didn't come into it um, the blank sheet of paper, and I work very closely with Gonzalo Munoz, who's the Chilean high-level champion, Chile, of course, president uh, of COP25, and current presidency, the handover to Alok Sharma in, in November. Um, and he had done something really interesting with this big community of business and city organizations to publish a whole series of pathways to 1.5 degrees, so net zero pathways. So what, what we've basically done is we've we've done a second version of those, and we've launched this big campaign we call the Race to Zero, really, really just to try and normalize getting to zero um, with, the, with the appropriate short-term actions as the thing which everyone is doing in support of the, um, the ratchet that is expected out of the Paris Agreement from the countries. So I remember um, back in, it's going to be COP, I think it must have been COP 20. No, 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 wait a minute. It was the, the one in, in Warsaw before Paris. COP19, yeah. COP19, yes. Um, and um, the Polish organizer, the Polish presidency, invited business. And everybody said, oh, it's just going to be a whole bunch of coal companies. And, uh, and this is completely ridiculous. These people should not be in the room. Business should not be in the room. Um, uh, so things seem to have moved on since then. Yeah, actually, there was a very interesting meeting in Warsaw in, 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 in COP19 to 2013, right? where the, the, the then Secretary General Ban Ki-moon invited a group of about I don't know, 20 of us who were either business leaders or people working with the business and investment community to basically say, we're not going to change the legal process. That's a negotiation between nation states. But we have to have the constructive voice of the other major forces in the world in the conversation. So Warsaw was the beginning of opening up and then Peru the next year really welcomed in those leadership and that and, and that led to the creation of the role that I have now and the sort of gradual opening up of the um, of the conversation to recognise that it's going to take the whole of society, not national governments can't do it on their own. So Nigel, how many cops have you been to? I'm, I, I've been to it's probably um, I'm going to say three or four. I was in Copenhagen, I was in Warsaw, I was in Paris. Um, I'm trying to think, uh, Bonn, um, and so on. So how how many have you been to? Probably about ten. Because I went to the first one I went to was Copenhagen. Remember, I, that's, I'd um, I'd recently moved from a twenty-year career in the private sector. I was working at CDP. Um, I was really excited to go to my first international climate negotiations, and was rather disappointed to find that the organisers couldn't even organise 
people getting into the conference facilities. I spent eight hours in sub-zero temperatures in a sort of post-apocalyptic scene from a dystopian film, um, not getting in despite having all the accreditation, which was a bit, which was a bit worrying. Perhaps that was a, a symbol of what was to come in Copenhagen. Yeah, so I, I remember now, I went to Poznan, actually, the year before. That was my first. So I've probably right. been to five or six of these things. And in Poznan, I had no idea what to expect. So I turned up and I got in and I was accredited. I can't remember quite how. So I went into one of the negotiations and I kid you not, they spent two hours discussing the agenda for a meeting where they would discuss something called Red Plus, which is to do with forestry, at some other point in the proceedings. And I'll tell you what I did. I went back to the hotel and I did some proper work for two days. I, did, I gave that was it done. That was my yeah. whole first involvement with COBS. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dismiss that as non-work. I mean, you know, trying to get consensus between over 190 countries on something that's as geopolitical as the energetic basis of the global economy is about as complicated a negotiation yeah. as you can imagine. And it's remarkable, given the, the political nature of that and the consensus requirement, that we got the Paris Agreement, which I, I think, I think I wrote about it a year after that, that, that um, in 30 years' time, if the Paris Agreement is successfully implemented and the ratchet process keeps going, that and in hundreds of years down, we'll look back on the Paris Agreement as the greatest ever treaty between nation states. Oh, I think Paris was a different world. And we had um, on this program, uh, Cristiano Figueres, who talked about how she turned it upside down. Instead of saying sort of top down, we'll have a carbon budget and then everybody will share it out. Big argument. And then we'll spend 50 years implementing. It's this kind of bottom up coalition yeah. of the willing. And I think that changed everything for me as a as a private sector commentator it went from being oh, you know this is an attempt to build world government it's going to fail you're going to have absurd uh, one of the other things they did at Poznan was they had these huge discussions about the comma and what did the comma mean and it was just days and days about a single comma and I think Paris really opened things up and changed the weather. I, I, I agree I think there were three three um, kind of genius bits of the Paris architecture one is that that's flipping from a 196 countries trying to negotiate everybody else's fair share. Which, you know, if you just look at the combinatorics of that, it's doomed to fail um, to that to that bottom up, which is a risky move, right? And I know Christiana didn't expect to have anything like the number of national plans turn up in time, but it was a it was a, it was strange in a weird way. It looked like a lowering of the ambition, but it was an empowering of ambition. The other the other the other thing um, was the welcoming of the non-state actor community into the conversation, which changes the dynamic. And and I think the third thing is that there are there are there are redundancies built into the Paris Agreement. For example, there's the um, there's not just the bottom up nature, but there's the there's the ratchet. So you get to you get to have a second and a third attempt. But also there's if the politics of a country mean you can't improve the short term, you also have to submit a long term strategy, which seems to have different politics. So it's very cleverly constructed to be really quite robust against the normal cycles of, of, of politics. Most of them, you know, the previous US incumbent notwithstanding. No, I agree. Um, I mean, on the previous US incumbent, the funny thing is that when he announced he was going to pull out, I immediately wrote that that's probably going to strengthen the architecture. And I think that's what we've seen. I don't know. I think, um, I think it gave a kind of license to be less collaborative, less multilateral to other actors and I think that so and, and I think certainly if if a Trump had won of, again a few of them but it also really it really gingered a whole bunch of others to lean in and and you know we had far more response from cities and and from a lot of the oh, sort of civic from, society and yeah. a lot of countries that just said you know and look at look, look at the role of you know look at the in a sense the closeness on climate between Europe and China which then of course in in you know I think a lot of the US uh, actors then looked at that and said, hang on a second, this is really dangerous. Yeah, I, th I mean, I totally agree that the non-state actors, I mean, the US, you know, it's businesses, cities, investors, schools, yeah. universities, states kept, you know, they had a whole campaign called We Are Still In, um, which is now turned into America's All In, you know, and we had hundreds of businesses writing to the administration saying, you better come out with a, a nationally determined contribution, a plan that starts with a five, it needs to be at least 50%. Uh, I also think the other thing that's changed, and you mentioned China is, in the last five years, everybody's realised this is not just this is not a green issue. This is a fundamental competitiveness issue. And if you're not if you're not you know I, I always use the example of Detroit in the 70s. You know, arrogantly getting reading the tea leaves wrong in the first oil crisis and thinking that they could still you know operate in a sort of seller's market. And as a result of which, there's lots of Asian and European smaller, more efficient cars on American roads even 50 years on from that. 
Now, I, I totally agree. I've been saying for a long time that climate is all about, it's actually industrial policy and trade policy. It's not environment. One of the problems is, of course, it's been located within environment ministries who are generally not powerhouse uh, ministries, you know, with some exceptions. Uh, and it's all about, it's, you know, it's between industry, trade and treasury, um, the finance ministries that, that this is going to get done. Um, so COP26 is coming to Glasgow and we've established that I've been to five or six and you've probably been to 10 of these things. Um, can you talk us through, because our audience, they're all, you've got to assume they're all smart and they're all engaged, but they don't know the ins and outs of uh, all of the technologies, et cetera, but also all of the negotiations and the mm. way that the COP and what happens, what, what happens at a normal COP? Because we also need to talk about what might happen at Glasgow because of COVID. But let's do a normal COP first between all of these different 30,000 people rock up. What do they do? Um, well, the first thing to say is that even a normal Glasgow without COVID would have been exceptional because it's the fifth COP after Paris. And Paris set up this five yearly promise review ratchet process. So the, the reason there's so much tension on Glasgow um, is that it's the first real test of the Paris Agreement. And I, um, uh, and that's COVID and no COVID. And, and the I real was like, test in the sense that countries are now supposed to ratchet. They're supposed to say, well, five years ago, we said we could do this, but now we've got technological process, you know, uh, uh, progress has happened. Uh, we've, we've put legislation in place and we think we can do more. And they're all supposed to say they can do more, right? Yeah, and I was, but I think there's sort of three elements of the test. It's, first, it's a test of the multilateral system. Like, can countries still come together and deal with those really complex negotiations you talked about? And and some of the Paris rules or the Paris rule book have not yet been finalised. So part of what needs to happen in Glasgow is some of those very detailed, technical, very important to business on transparency, on timetables for reporting between countries. You know the kind of things that. Um, you know, every, everybody in the private sector will recognise as being crucial. Like, you know, when when do you have to report your results in what format to your stakeholders? You know, occupies a lot of um, C-suite time. So there's still some of that technical negotiation, which is crucial. Maybe not so materially economically, but in terms of the faith in the multilateral system. Then there's the ratchet process. Is the Paris mechanism working? Most of that we'll know before Glasgow, because of course we've already seen these new plans: the EU 55%, the US 50%, the UK 68% reductions by 2030. So I mean, I think you can make an argument that the ratchet pro process in terms of mitigation is working. We haven't heard yet from other big big economies and countries like India and China in terms of their their plan, but the, the signals are strong. I mean, there are other elements of ratchet like finance from the global north to the global south, which is is less strong so far and, and focus on the need to um to act in to build resilience given that we've already got a lot of extreme weather events locked in um so, I, so that's the second bit is that is that are the countries stepping up enough and the third bit is is the real economy moving enough like does this does you know does this start to feel like things are really happening in in in, in markets and in economies and in our daily lives um and i think each of those has a has its own sort of bar of whether people decide that Glasgow has been a success or not. And you, you have to, I think for Glasgow to be seen as a success, you'd have to see progress on all three of those. It's an interesting one because I think that Glasgow is already a success built in from a, uh, because you've got all of these net zero pledges uh, that cover something like 80% of the global economy by 2060. If you include, you know, most countries 2050, uh, China and Brazil 2060. And uh, so if that gets if those gets get translated into nationally determined contributions, which is just the kind of the the delivery of a report, you know, and 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 so on, then it's going to be a huge success because it is so far beyond even Paris and the rest of it. I mean, Article Six and all of this stuff about the, you know all the rest of it. Does the average person really care? Will they even notice that stuff? No, I think the average person doesn't really care, but the majority of the countries who are part of the multilateral process do remember that the, the, a majority of countries self-identify as climate vulnerable. In other words, you know, and the, and, the, the, and the climate injustice of we didn't cause it, you did, we're suffering from it more than you are, is at the heart of the politics, which is why things like the, the commitments on finance um, and action on resilience are as important to many countries or more important than the net zero. So I think it's possible that this is a net zero COP, but not a success because of that. So I think you're right that we're making huge progress in terms of net zero becoming a North Star. I mean, the question really is, are the short term plans up to that ambition? But 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 for the majority of countries who are, who are parties to the 
you know, the Paris Agreement, it's about more than net zero. It's also about finance and um, resilience. It is. I, I just, I suppose I come at it, you know, perhaps with a different, you know, a slightly different perspective, private sector and also politically, I'm, I'm not, I'm not as, I don't come at it from a tradition of, you know, of, of social justice uh, nearly as much as others. I mean, I'm very committed to that, but, you know, as long as the big economies are on track, have, you know, committed to net zero and that comes out of Glasgow look incredible, you know, will there be some other countries, you know, running around saying, oh, it's not enough and it's not legally binding and nobody wrote me a check and, and you know, and so on. I, I mean, I, in, in some way, I don't think that that's going to cast a shadow over the huge achievements of moving from Paris to Glasgow. I just can't see that really being an overshadowing thing that could cause it to be regarded as a failure, if I'm honest. Yeah, well, I, I think I beg to differ there. If you think about the context we have in terms of covid um, yeah. and vaccine diplomacy and fiscal pressure on a lot of middle income and least developed countries that, that I think that how well the global system is coming together in solidarity and what is effectively a post-war moment economically now you know do, do we have the equivalent of a Marshall Plan approach to refloating the whole economy or do we have a bifurcation so I think it's not a, it's not a done deal by any means I think Michael. No, I just think it's a difference between, you know, what the, the Guardian might say, this is all absolutely tragic because we missed this opportunity and that opportunity. But if, the, as far as I'm concerned, if the billions and then trillions are flowing to the solutions in the big emitting economies, that is, you know, that, that's the key. That's that's the key to success, in, in, in my view, and not to minimize the and certainly not to minimize the suffering coming out of COVID, which is which is just as we're seeing in India. just, yeah. just a well, so I, 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 I think it's, I think it's both and so yeah. so I mean it's yeah. one reason why oh. as well as the race to zero we've also launched no, a no. race to resilience. You know, Nigel, to in a, in a, I, absolutely both and would be would be the best of all outcomes. And uh, but I do think I just think I, we're going to see a success. The question is, is it a both and success or is yeah. it? Is it um, and of I'll, course, we move straight into the kind of can we deliver this stuff? Because there's no point in the commitments and the end and the national de determined uh, contribution. The plans are worth nothing without execution. Uh, well, I think I think that will be really um, under the microscope in, in Glasgow is are the commitments from the public and the private sector turning into plans in a, in a credible way. It's also worth, in terms of getting it done, it's also worth remembering that you know most of the infrastructure that's going to be built in the world is going to be in the global south in the next decade. You know, most of the, most of the urbanization, most of the you know, new grids, most of the new ports. So it, it does matter how they're done, not just in the high emitting countries, but in the in the growing economies of the global south. So I think it's, um, yeah, it's complex. I want to pick you up on one thing that you said, which is that you had this 20 year career in the private sector. Um, and um, you were working with an aerospace company, was it? Um, uh, or, or, automotive, actually. I, I worked at, I worked at, well, I worked in Lucas, which was, um, you know, was one of the bastions of British engineering in the in, in, when I was working there in the 80s and 90s that was aerospace and automotive but I ended up okay. spending most of my so time. So you were mainly on the automotive so you were automotive. in the automotive sector you were a factory manager you were an operations yeah. director and then what what happened because you're now I mean this is obviously you're you're now this high level champion for climate uh -huh. action and, and all the way from 2007 you've been completely dedicated to climate action through the um, carbon disclosure project now CDP through We Mean Business, the Race to Zero, the Climate Action uh, Champion. What, what happened to you in 2006, <laughs> seven? I mean, was this just an epiphany? You know, this is, no, there's nothing in your background before then that I can well, suggest it. Well, you, you, need to look, you need to look a bit closer. I mean, two, two things really, I would say. One, um, I've always been an outdoorsman with a particular fascination for the, 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 the polar regions. I spent a lot of time um, climbing and ski touring in Iceland, Greenland, Patagonia as a young man. And actually in 1987 came across the stark impact of climate change when I was supposed to be doing some scientific work on the snout of a glacier, which um, to cut a long story short, wasn't where it should have been because it had retreated by like 20 kilometers. It was like, you know, if you're a young mountaineer, you know, the map is the truth. So to come to a point on the map where a massive object, like a, like a five kilometer wide glacier is not there, but there's just water. It's, it's, I mean, that maybe was an epiphany that sort of deep down, I never had any question about believing this was real. Um, and then and then what actually happened in 2006, I was I was part of a team that um, bought out and built up TMD Friction, it's the biggest manufacturer of brake pads in the world. And um, 
then um, I was I was on the on the exec co working very closely with the CEO and the CEO f- um, and the CEO and the chair decided to part company. So I went with the CEO, and then I didn't know what and, and I've been working there for ten years and I didn't know what to do. So I spent took some time thinking, and and that sort of brought the sort of if you like the environmentalist in me or the wilderness lover in me together. I felt because I because I, I met. I kept meeting environmentalists who were like, your business is the problem or greedy business people or interest bearing debt. And I was like, really? Um, if you want to start a business, you need interest bearing debt. You know, if you want everything that you're using to run your campaigns is produced by business. Um, so I don't think business is the problem. I think maybe the way that we're directing markets is the problem. So I, so what I'm really fascinated by is how, how markets can serve society rather than the other way, the other way around. So that, that's how I ended up doing this work. Okay. Now that's fascinating. I, so first of all, um, uh, I did not know that you were a ski uh, mountaineer, ski tourer. So I've ski toured to uh, Mount Elbrus, Europe's tallest mountain. So uh, I think we're going to have to have, uh, uh, we're going to have to talk about the ski touring, but if we I do totally, that I'm, now, we will go off and spend. Yeah. Okay. We won't do that. Now. And yeah. By the way, the, the audience, who knows the audience might prefer us to do great <laughs> ski tours we've been on, but I will tell you that the, the, um, the glacier as an epiphany. So I was actually um, cross country skiing. I did the Engadin ski marathon and I brought lots of people to do it for charity. But I went up one side valley from Pontresina uh, one year. And this would have been about 2002, three, just as I was thinking about what to do with my sad, wretched life, having been spat out by the dot com boom bust. And I went up this side valley and I saw a sign saying, 1832 and I thought well that's probably the altitude uh, and then I saw a sign saying 1855 and I thought well that's odd because it's been flat but maybe it's the altitude and then I saw 1870 and then 1910 1920 and so on and these were the years when the glacier reached that point of the valley and yeah. I was ski tour I was not ski touring I was I was you know cross-country skiing I went on and on and on kilometers through the through you know forests and whatever and eventually got to the snout of the glacier which was now absolutely kilometers further away and that was one of the sort of foundation stories behind my you know commitment to new energy finance well you know i, I we won't go into this in detail but i went um, with johan rockstrom and a group to the swedish arctic a few years ago to the oldest um glacial research station um and uh the, the the highest mountain in sweden has two peaks and two years ago what was the highest mountain, which was glaciated, became the second highest mountain. So, I mean, it's, yeah. it's like, so that all the books are wrong. The, the, yeah. you know, the North Peak is now the second highest. So. Oh, and there are plenty of um, ski, yeah. uh, there were plenty of normal climbing routes in the Alps you can no longer do because rocks fall and you just don't have the time to get yeah. past safely and so on. So, you, you probably know that already. But, um, so, but I think, I do think that these kind of epiphany stories are very important, um, particularly as we both come out of a private sector, very private sector. Um, the, because so much of what's happening now, you look at all this ESG, you look at sustainable finance, is about other people, frankly, having these epiphanies and then trying to integrate it into their work life. But maybe not by saying, oh, well, I'll give up everything and join the carbon disclosure project or start an information provider about you know, low carbon energy. But they're having to do some quite difficult work to integrate it into what they do every day. And I guess that's what your championing is kind of all about. Yeah, the thing, the, the thing that surprised me when I made that change was, you know, I kind of, like many people do who work in the private sector, but have never worked in any other sector, assumed that all of the innovation and all of the entrepreneurial behavior was in the private sector. And of course, if you work in a big company, there's actually not that much space for entrepreneurial behavior. I mean, okay, we, 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 we bought out a company and grew it. So there was a fair degree of entrepreneurial behavior there. But the most on, most entrepreneurial work that I've ever done in my life has been in not for profits. I mean, growing CDP, I joined when there's about 10 of us. CDP is now got 450 employees and is quite an important part of the global infrastructure. Um, and we mean business, you know, we, we, we founded from scratch and it's like, it's, it's so intellectually and entrepreneurially, I've, I've, I've actually had more fun in these kind of roles. And I guess now I'm sort of entrepreneurially trying to bring about global systems change. So that's quite a intellectual challenge as well. Not not ambitious at all, then. <laughs> well, one of the things I one of the people people who really know me know that I'm quite, I don't know, I'm you know just maybe a background as a competitive sportsman, but I'm, I am really I am really ambitious. I just so and one of the things I love about this role is actually the role is to be pushy, so I can turn up and say sorry, but it's my job. I have to push you to be more ambitious than you already are. So that's quite a lot of fun. 
I'll tell you, there is, I think, a whole, um, a whole uh, media uh, opportunity for somebody to look at competitive sports people who've gone into NGOs, but particularly into climate and environment, because you're a rugby player, you're a rugby blue, I discovered, researching yeah. for this. I, uh, I obviously have my skiing background, yeah. Yeah. Um, but there's, they do pop up, Olympians and uh, elite sports people, they do pop up. And sometimes, sometimes you don't even realize, you don't know for, you know, uh, I, you know I kind of wear it a little bit on my sleeve. Um, I want to shift to the energy system uh, and the players there that you're working with, because this episode of Cleaning Up, uniquely, it's the first time we've done this, has been uh, sponsored and, and enabled by Euroelectric, which is the association of all the different players in the European electricity industry. Now, um, we had Christian Ruby on this, uh, on Cleaning Up, uh, it was episode 34, so it was uh, you know a couple of months ago, and I asked him what percentage of the world's energy system is going to be electricity. And it's currently about 20%. And I was rather surprised that he said 60%. He didn't say 100%. He didn't say electrify everything, because there are some people who say electrify everything and then make the electricity uh, zero carbon. How deeply are you in those sorts of debates and discussions? Well, I mean, I, learned, I mean, a lot of what has informed my thinking about the energy transition was through um, several years on the Energy Transitions Commission, I think, which we found, found which um, I think Adair Turner and RJ Matur um, started. I think, I mean, I was there from the start about four years. I had to step down when I took on this role, but of course, into that, all that research onto the, the, the energy transition and then onto the hard to abate sector transitions which, which of course is, is part of the puzzle right um so i think um for me the really interesting thing is just how quickly even people who've been experts in sectors you know have been in a sector for 30 years how quickly given exposure to the facts um people can change their minds i mean uh, I think you've written, I'm interested to hear your view on hydrogen. I think you've you know, written, is, are we in the third hydrogen bubble or is this the real deal this time? But certainly one thing I saw with, with, with CEOs from power production, um, grids, um, uh, you know, hydrocarbon sector, sector and, and materials, which have huge energy demands, um, a, a gradual sort of epiphany as, as people realize that, yes, we're going to have to electrify the hell out of everything. So that, you know, that, 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 that massive, which means that there's kind of no regrets to building more generating capacity pretty much right now. But also that there's going to be a really significant role for, for hydrogen, for green hydrogen, which of course means itself means more, elect more electricity. So I, I'm interested in that 60%, whether you count the green hydrogen as, because the green hydrogen is really electricity, right, as well. Yeah, so I, I do, I count, you know, green hydrogen would be electricity because you have to, you have to go through the electricity stage. Yeah. Um, and when you you ask me sort of you know do, do I think it's a hydrogen the third hydrogen bubble after the sort of the the, the 1980s and then there was the 2000s and are we just every 20 years we have a hydrogen bubble and it's very distractive and way, uh, distracting and you know destroys capital I actually think we're kind of in half a hydrogen bubble right. I think that hydrogen in obviously replacing the grey hydrogen with clean hydrogen green or blue or pink which is what they call hydrogen from nuclear. Um, and um, uh, and I think then the hydrogen will go into other things. So it will not just do, um, currently you use hydrogen mainly in uh, ammonia, so fertilizers and in petrochemicals and plastics and so on. Um, but I think, and that's all at the moment, dirty hydrogen, uh, gray hydrogen, that will change to clean. But I think hydrogen will go further. It might do steel. It will almost certainly do some form of e-fuels for aviation. There's a few sectors where it's- and uh, Shipping, include, shipping probably. Shipping, yes, pro probably. I'm a bit, I'm a bit worried about shipping. Everybody's in love with ammonia at the moment. Ammonia is a nasty substance, by the way. But so I'm, I'm, I'm ninety percent with the ammonia fans. So yes, um, petrol's, petrol's not that nice a substance, is it? No, but it doesn't. It does if blow you have up. A petrol leak. It doesn't inter instantly blow up your lungs, which anhydrous ammonia does. Right, so okay. uh, we've got a bit of work to. I've got to get my head around uh, what yeah. the options are there. Um, but, you know, but if it's not hydrogen, then it's probably something like methanol. So it'll be an e-fuel. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Um, and then hydrogen providing deep resilience. We've got to have, you know, you said race to resilience. We've got to, I think, talk much more about deep resilience, getting through two weeks, three weeks of 
you know, no sun, no wind or uh, big interconnections falling over between electrical grids and stuff that we're not really talking about and we're not ready for. And I think hydrogen, because you can store it in salt caverns and so on, it might play a big role there. But hydrogen in transport, land transport and hydrogen in heating, even industrial heating, I'm very skeptical about. Even, even though some of the vehicle manufacturers seem to be, you know, like Daimler and Volvo have got a joint venture, they seem to be betting on it Daimler, as the top, top end. So what Daimler and Volvo have done is having tried to get um, f hydrogen fuel cell cars going and they, what they've actually done is taken their IP and dumped it into a JV, which is usually, you know, you're a private sector guy. You don't put your crown jewels into a JV with one of your competitors. So I, I actually think that that's a, that's a, um, a, a side bet. What's actually happening, what they are doing and they are marketing is, uh, is electric trucks. Um, and, um, and I think we're going to see that, you know, th th we're going to see them, how can I put it, you know, roaring off to the horizon and the fuel cell stuff will just, I think, probably never happen, even in, even in long distance trucking. All right. Interesting. I, I, I mean, I think, I think the jury's still out there, but um, I, I don't have a strong view um, either way, but I do think it's interesting how fast the trucking sector has committed to getting to zero. You've seen the, yeah. the agreement, agreement in Europe that all the truck manufacturers in Europe have committed to 2040 phase out of combustion engines and it's funny that the commission is still talking about 2050 <laughs> it's just like things are changing so fast that if you've got a long policy making cycle you almost can't keep up with the i mean same thing yeah, same I, thing with businesses you know right if you if you've got a long r d cycle you can't keep up with the pace of change yeah and i think what they've what they've seen now is we're starting to see that experience curve in batteries coming down and, and they've all looked at the supply chain the critical minerals you know rare earths lithium you know, copper, nickel, even cobalt. And they're sort of saying, well, you know, they there are no showstoppers and the costs are coming down. And 20%, so that gives 20 them the bravery. A year, right? um, oh, I, well, I, it's 20% it's, it's per doubling in cumulative volume. So it's, it's not quite per year because that would suggest it keeps going linear, you know, uh, at the same rate over time. But it's, but it's yes, fast. There's costs yeah. are coming down very fast. It, you know, so... And I think that's the beauty to link it back to the COP process. That's the beauty because um, they would never have made those commitments. The trucking industry was not making those commitments back in 2015, but it's able to do it in 2021. And then, of course, at the national level, you feel empowered, I suspect, as a negotiator to make a bigger commitment. Yeah, I mean, I just think this is a classic example of systems change. Right? I mean, I think of the EV change, you, know, you had disruptors like Tesla, but you also had cities like London and Paris saying we're going to have ultra low emission zones. That, that then you have then you have SMEs delivering into London saying yeah, but where are the electric trucks? So then you have you know then you have demand signals going to the the Daimlers and Volvos of this world. Of course, all the while you've got the the, the batteries costs coming down. And then you I mean the UK, I think it's only two years between a 2040 phase out date and then nego and then consulting on a 2032 to 2035 phase out date when most of the private sector said. Like the Energy Transitions Commission, we in business, even the oil majors said, don't don't mess around with 2032 to 2035, bring it forward straight to 2030, because that'll give us the clarity to invest into, because we know it's going to die sometime in the 30s. So I think that's been a really interesting example of just how fast things can change, yeah. with all those different actors playing a role. Although there was a little rearguard action. I, um, I had a bit of fun. I caught um, Aston Martin and Robert Bosch. Um, pushing a little leaflet that said, oh, we mustn't write off e-fuels. Uh, e-fuels for cars is the stupidest thing. Just the sheer amount of electricity you would need to generate to make the hydrogen, to capture the carbon, to combine them to, you know, and then you get this horrendously inefficient combustion engine in the car, um, which of course wastes, you know, 80% uh, of what you uh, stick in the car. Uh, I just I just think it's a total fantasy. I don't understand fantasy. it. When you, when you look at those costs coming down and everybody agrees that we're going to reach sticker price parity within the next, say, three years, is, even if you think that's a stretch and it's going to be six years why would anyone buy a combustion engine car when it's more expensive um, to buy more expensive to run uh, doesn't last as long by then isn't as cool and sexy which is what cars have been sold as i just think it's a fantasy bet and that i can't i, I think this exponential is going to increase in that you know be a game over for combustion engines very soon and so uh... The role of utilities in all of that, you know, I, I have to confess, and I talked about this with Christian Ruby when he came on the show, I was amazed at the European utilities that they've, the fact that they chose Christian, who comes out of a wind, uh, the wind industry background, but the way the utilities in Europe 
have sort of, you know, they just embraced this agenda. And, um, you know, it, it amazed me. And, and I was, I've always wondered, you know, is it just because they saw, oh, electric heating, electric cars, this is cool, this will, this will you know, this will provide our, you know, this will drive up our revenues. Do you think it's that or, or, or something deeper? Well, I think it's a mix of just play, you know, straightforward self-interest. I mean, you know, unlike, say, oil and gas or automotive, where you've got to completely flip the technology at the heart of your business to survive, um, once the utilities had realized they were going to have to do that in terms of renewables, I th which I think had already happened, I think then there was a sort of epiphany like, oh, my God, everyone else is going to have to electrify the hell out of stuff. And that's, you know, we're going to be at the heart and we're going to, have, we're going to play in new industries like suddenly we're made we're on, suddenly we have a major role in transport which we had no role in before so i think it's a mixture of having gone through the disruption earlier um and so you had a, i think when Euroelectric um really changed it was when it had like nlssc and orsted as chair and co-chairs and suddenly went from being a normal trade association which is kind of trying to slow down policy change to being a front foot policy organization saying no let's go faster let's go faster um but i think i mean i think they were able to do that because because it's such a positive story for the sector, right? Well, one thing I do find interesting is if you look at the question of gas, gas is the bridge fuel, that argument used to be made by sort of all of the incumbents, but more recently, it's only made by oil and gas companies you, you, and, and pipeline companies. You, you just don't see utilities saying, you know, wait a minute, we've got to have gas, gas is, gas is good, you know, on the, n n none of them are promoting that line, um, which is, I think is, you know, and these are the people who presumably know most about uh, what the future holds in the electrical sector. And, and you don't find transmission grid operators saying, oh, we're very worried about resilience, we really need the gas, the gas, 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 gas as a bridge for you. That's not what they're saying. No, and again, I think because they can see the you know, they've, they're, 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 there's probably the sector that's furthest through its own disruption. Mm. Right. And so and so that's actually it's gone. You know, if you think about 20 years ago, the electric utility industry was a very old industry. Nothing had really changed much for a very long time. Like many sectors, like really fundamentally, oil, you know, oil and gas, automotive, I mean, yeah, the same basic business model. But but electric utility starts got, were, were the first to be really disrupted. And so I think having having survived that, those leaders who, who, who basically became the leaders mm. of your electric were, the, were, were, were people like Francesco Storacci who had, who had led the kind of green revolution within his own business and was then promoted to CEO of the whole business. And sim similarly, of course, Orsted and SSC. So I, I, I think it's interesting. I, I, I just noticed last week that Uniper um, have just, who were going to invest in a big LNG terminal in Wilhelmshaven in Northern Germany, had just scrapped that idea and gone for green hydrogen and ammonia infrastructure instead and and recently the world bank and others have basically poured very cold water on the idea that gas might be a, a bridging fuel for shipping so i think lots of people that yes i think you're right it's a, it's a classic sort of fight between an incumbency which sees stranded assets and and and, and, and an alternative provider who doesn't see any need for those assets but then you've still got um north stream 2 you've still got um you know, the attempt to bring in a big gas pipeline from uh, Russia to Germany. Um, you've got Belgium shutting down its nuclear and building um, three or more new gas plants. And Germany, if they complete their nuclear early shutdown, you've got to, I mean, I, I, it's almost inevitable that they will be burning more gas, at least in the short term, for, um, short term being a decade. You know, five six seven years so are you are you also in your championing what do you get engaged in how can i put it the difficult cases you know do you sort of just spend your time hanging around with the star you know francesco Storacci, you know if he's listening i've got to get it I've, francesco i've got to get you on to cleaning up you're such a visionary um but do you hang around only with people like that or do you also get sort of sent in to talk to the difficult cases well uh, um to be frank, what I mean, I spent a lot of my time trying to point to the inevitability of the transformation and what is already happening on the ground. So I'll focus on things like last week, like Moody's on the back of the 70 trillion of assets behind the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero saying this, there's a credit squeeze coming here for heavy emitters who haven't got a plan or the, or the Uniper announcement because they're, they're, they're pointing to change. You know, the media tend to be 
not so good at pointing to early signs of change once things are going mainstream. Um, but um, gas is a good example of something where I've, I've realized in the last year that actually we don't collectively have a shared sense of the future um, and, 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 and the role of gas as a transition fuel or not, or to what extent is something that we, we have to get our heads around. So it's something that, you know, I just, I've just, I've just started looking at and I don't, I don't, I, I, I don't, all I know is there are some very strong opinions in, in, in different directions. My, my suspicion is that, um, that there's a sort of incumbency holding on playing a bit of a King Canute role because that, that, that's normal. Um, and that the, 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 um, the technology, the, you know, technology will drive that transition faster than people think. But the question of what is that transition, what does it look like? Um, I think it's something we've got to get a collective head around. So I think it's to make these kind of transitions, it's really helpful that we have a shared sense of what they are, not just total chaos. And I don't think we have got a shared sense of that at the moment. And do you think that the weather is changing on nuclear in the developed world? I mean, obviously, China has remained committed. Russia's remained committed. India's remained committed. The Gulf region is getting sort of uh, uh, starting to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, it's commissioning uh, the Baraka um, uh, power station and a few others. Um, but it's been very troubled in, uh, in, in the West. But do you think that the mood is shifting? Do you think there are now more people understanding that these things just produce huge amounts of low carbon electricity? And at least we have to maintain the ones we've got. Well, I think I think that at least we have to maintain the ones we got, um, which, by the way, I've always struggled to understand Germany's logic of you know rapidly shutting down nuclear power stations that were not in a tsunami risk zone, as far as I'm aware, um, which, which of course has led to burning you know brown coal for a lot lot longer than they would have had to. So I think that keeping nuclear power stations running, you know, the assets that were already there. My sense is that that's, I mean, not everybody, of course, some people are just ideologically against nuclear, but the assets are already there. I think there's a strong sense that, you know, keep them running as long as safely possible. And, and I, th I think the, the, the argument for new nuclear increasingly seems to be one about cost, right? Michael, I mean, you know, I don't know how much is Hinkley going to cost. I mean, it was 92 strike price index linked. So it's probably at 105 already, right? So it's like, it's, it's, you know, it's multiples of alternative sources. I, I do think some of the, I mean, and you'll know more about this than I, what, you know, what really is the potential for floating wind? What really is the potential for North Africa to be a massive, um, you know, supplier to, to Europe via undersea DC cables? Um, you know, when we start thinking bigger about resilience, um, what are the other plays? Nuclear might be one of them, and I, and I know there's, a, there's there's work going on in small modular reactors, but um, again, I, I don't know how, I don't know how close that is to being um, executable, or, or, or how early early that is in terms of the. And that doesn't seem to me like it's something for the next five years, but maybe beyond that. Now, certainly, just to, to translate them, you use some numbers with respect to Hinkley. It's one hundred and forty dollars per megawatt hour. So if you go into dollars, you you were quoting some to, numbers in, in yeah, GDP sorry, to, in pounds. That's the that's today given that's, the index linking. Yeah, yeah. And, at, and at that price, you know, there are just lots of other ways to do things that are that are uh, cheaper. Um, but these are really big discussions, and I'm a big fan of uh, at the moment. I should declare I've, I've got a, a a tiny angel investment in something called X Links, which wants okay, yeah. to bring in uh, North African solar and wind uh, buffered through a battery, so dispatchable renewable energy into the UK, electricity into the UK. Um, at a at a you know, sort of forty or fifty pounds uh, per yeah. megawatt hour price. Uh, uh, so so half half the cost of Hinkley at, and the same sort of scale of, as, as a nuclear and, plant, dispa right? and dispatchable and dispatchable. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, but these big these big chunks of uh, of discussions that we have to have. I guess my my uh, I would I would um, ask again whether those are things that you with your COP twenty six climate ch action champion hat. Um, are you, you know, because the criticism of the climate, uh, the race to zero or the uh, climate action champions is that it very much focuses on the developing world, the vulnerabilities, the, you know, um, the, the transfer of funds from north to south. You know, and the UNFCCC overall spends an enormous amount of its time and resource focusing on those issues. But there is another approach, which is let's look at the the 20 biggest emitters in the world and let's use Nigel to talk to them and tick off the big chunks 
which is well, aviation, actually, shipping. A, a, you know, actually, you're the, you're the first person who's criticised me for spending too much time on the developing world. So I'm, I'm pleased with that because I feel there's a, <laughs> a bit of a need to bounce it up. So I spent, I spent most of my time on, you know, big industry, big sectors, big emitters, and how do we... Nigel, it wasn't a critique of you. No, 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 but it's not a critique I've heard before. Right. Um, I think, um, I mean, what, I've been, what, I've, what we've really been trying to focus on is normalising net zero with robust targets into it as, as something that everybody has to do. Um, and trying to get a sense of of convergence on pathways. Um, and I would say, Michael, one of the things that I'm looking to do in the next 12 months, and this should be through COP26 and beyond, is actually shine more light on where there are valid contentious issues, not yeah. just not just not just unreasonable lobbying positions. And I and I and I, I think, you know, one of one of my sort of mentors in the systems thing always says when two intelligent people disagree about something it's it's worth paying attention not just dismiss you know like right. so if you and i disagree about the role of hydrogen or the role of nuclear i, w- I would want to get i want to double click and say what are we, what are the assumptions that we're both making you know because because it's un- it's the future it's uncertain so we'll be making different assumptions so i think that we as we get more sophisticated this kind of global industrial strategy which is i know i always use the example of telephony where we're used to the idea of generations like 4g to 5g it feels seems to me like we need to agree the broad direction for the next generation with no regrets, while still debating and discussing and arguing about the, the, the generations beyond that. And there are a series of issues like you know, the role of offsets, the role of carbon capture, the role of gas, which are all very confusing and contentious. And you could have five people working on climate change at the moment, and you'd definitely get five different views on each of those issues. And I, th- I think we need to have better conversations about them rather than just shouting at each other from the corners. Look, I'm delighted to hear that um, because uh, one of the things I've been working on is something called the Climate Action Solutions Centre, CASC, which um, I've put together a little consortium and we've uh, rented some space just outside Glasgow and uh, it's to have exactly those double click discussions where you, you click in and you do the difficult stuff where there are legitimate uncertainties and knotty problems so that we get beyond what we want to do is to create a space where you know the CEOs or the mayors who make these wonderful announcements about net zero can then come into a into a space and say actually these bits I know about but here's a bunch of stuff I don't know how to deliver what I've just committed and we'll get stakeholders and discuss that and, and I'd hope that maybe we can um, involve you. Well I'd love to because I think I think we need more of those uh, sort of respectful conversations where we're not just pitching prepared notes or saying how our company was born sustainable 150 years ago and and that's you know all those sort of prepared speeches that we've all heard a thousand times which are frankly boring and don't and don't and don't help us get to the solutions it's much more those conversations where we can actually admit that we don't know everything or explain why we have a certain view because we're because of the way we think about the uncertainties i think we need to get much better at having those and i think we are getting better at that but there's still some very thorny issues that um uh we haven't collectively addressed enough i think very good so i look forward to uh getting you involved in uh, defining and then hopefully getting the stakeholders together to have those conversations um just finally cop 26 is not the only thing you work on because you talked about how you're going to do stuff beyond cop 26 but um for cop 26 uh final question optimistic pessimistic or neutral and why um i think uh, uh, overall optimistic for the reasons we discussed at the beginning just the sheer amount of momentum on 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 net zero i mean the politics is lining up private sector you know capital markets hugely piling in the, my my my, my my word of caution is about the 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 global politics of climate change and that um uh that climate justice question which is at the heart of the geopolitics of climate change and whether that makes enough progress for in the round to be seen as success i think remains there's, there's plenty of work to be done there still nigel thank you so much for joining us uh here today uh it's been a great pleasure and as always, when you and I talk, there are uh, we end up with more things to follow up than we've been able to cover on the day. Um, but thank you very, very much for your time. No, great. Thank you, Mark. It's been a pleasure. And I look forward to following up, especially on the ski touring. So that was Nigel Topping, the high level champion for climate action for COP26 later this year in Glasgow, talking about his multi stakeholder coalitions in the race to zero. My guest next week is James Thornton. He's the CEO of Client Earth, 
He's been using his expertise in law to build a team of environmental lawyers to hold governments to account on issues like air pollution and other aspects of the environment. Please join me at this time next week for a conversation with James Thornton.